no, this is KWXY. <laughs> this is an audio test, testing audio to the live stream. This is an audio test, testing audio to the live stream, Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees meeting. Today's date is Michelle, is December 6th, it's 
Good evening. Okay, we are going to call this meeting to order at 4.30. Um, we'll go on to item 1.2. Board Secretary Reese, please call the roll. Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Present. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduak Joe Intuk. Here. Sunny Zia. Here. Item 1.3, public comments on closed session items. A total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes per subject. Board Secretary Reese, are there any requests? No requests. Great. So we will take item 1.4, 1.5, 1.6, 1.7, 1 and 1.8 into closed session. Uh, item 1.9, we are recess into closed session at this time, and that is 432.
Thank you. The board is uh, reconvening to open session from closed session. Uh, I'm Herlinda Chico. I'm the president of the Board of Trustees. My pronouns are she, her. And thank you for joining us for the open session. We do have a report out of closed session. Uh, item 1.5, personnel pursuant to government code section 54957, public employee employment performance evaluation, discipline, dismissal, release, employee. Uh, ID number 0770893, uh, action was taken, 5-0 vote. And employee ID 0673185, action was taken, 5-0 vote. Uh, there were no other reportable action, and so we are now moving on to item 2.2, the Pledge of Allegiance, and I'm going to ask Loy to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Thank you. Item 2.3, land acknowledgement. Long Beach City College acknowledges our presence on the traditional ancestral land of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples. This land remains unceded territory. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced removal from this territory. Long Beach City College honors and respects the Gabrielino Tongva ancestors and their connection to this land. Item 2.4, roll call board. Secretary Reese, please call the roll. Virginia Baxter. Here. Herlinda Chico. Present. Vivian Malaulu. Here. Uduakjo Intuk. Here. Sunny Zia. Aye. Student Trustee Hernandez. Oh, I'm sorry, Mineta. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hernandez was. It's a very <laughs> old note on my thing here. I'm sorry. And she is absent this evening. Okay. Um, item 2.5 the report out on closed session. As I mentioned, there was uh, one action. Uh, taken and no other report out. Item 2.6, public comments on agenda items. A total of three minutes will be allotted to each speaker with a maximum of 20 minutes per subject. Board Secretary Reese, any requests? No requests. Thank you. Item 2.7, approval of the minutes of November 8th, 2023, regular Board of Trustees meeting. This is an action item. Um, and the recommended action is that the Board of Trustees approve the minutes of the November 8th, 2023 regular Board of Trustees meeting as submitted. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. So moved. Sarah, second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion passes. Uh, item 2.8, reordering of the agenda. Uh, only for requesting to move agenda item to a different time on the agenda. Any requests? Uh, I will now turn the meeting over to Superintendent President Dr. Munoz, who will preside over agenda items 3.1 and 3.2. Thank you, Board President Chico. For item 3.1, this is a recognition item. In recognition of your service, Board President Chico, for our Board President year, fiscal year, excuse me, school year, December 2022 to December 2023, as the Long Beach Community College District Board of Trustees, we would like to present you with this plaque commemorating your service as Board President. And so what I would love to do is maybe give an opportunity for any of the, your Board colleagues to share anything they'd like to share, and then maybe we can go to the front for a group photo. So I'll open the floor to your colleagues. Trustee Malulu. Thank you, Dr. Munoz. I would like to acknowledge and say thank you to Board President Chico for being um, an outstanding board president in her tenure from when she first got elected and she became board vice president till now. She's been the voice of reason in many ways and she's been able to move the meetings along and keep us grounded in closed session. So I'm really grateful for your leadership and I look forward to continuing to work with you, um, you know, as we begin this new year. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Antuck. Uh, 
I too want to commend you on your year of service. Uh, I know it's it's quite difficult as board president. There's you're the signatory and all the documents. You have all the invites to events. So you get to speak and do all the press releases, and it's it is quite a bit. So I uh, just want to thank you for your commitment and time. I know you, you don't get paid extra to be the board president, <laughs> and the rest of us. Uh, <laughs> no, <laughs> but it it's uh, I think you did a great job of demonstrating leadership and collaboration and helping us move along uh, on items and reach agreement and consensus many times. And so just thank you for, for your service and I appreciate what you've done. Uh, President Chico, I, I also want to salute you. I'm so impressed with your growth from the beginning till now. You really have it down. It, you've done a terrific job and uh, we're very proud of you. Thank you. President Chico, I am very proud of you. Um, I know we've had um, our uh, moments uh, as any two human beings do, but I am very impressed and you were fair. We worked through issues, you were always open, you listened and you were receptive and you weren't dogmatic about your viewpoints. That says a lot about you. Um, so I commend you and I also wanted to let you know that I think you've been the best president we've had in my tenure of nine and a half years. Thank you. So if the board can join me at the front, we can present Board President Chico with her plaque. Oh, please. Yes, Board President Chico. So um, before we all go down there, um, that was high praise, um, Trustee Zia, and I really, really appreciate it. Um, each one of you has so much to contribute and so much to offer um, and are outstanding in your roles, and I've learned from each one of you. Um, so much and I appreciate that we were able to work collaboratively and as a team and um, I think we're a better board for that. Um, I look forward to continuing to support uh, each other in our efforts. Um, it has been difficult but as leaders we have to make really tough decisions sometimes that we don't always agree on and that's okay um, so long as we're listening to each other. So. From the bottom of my heart, I really do want to say um, how much I appreciate each and every one of you, uh, and then working with our executive team, uh, the vice presidents, um, our uh, academic senate, our, our representatives, and Dr. Munoz. Um, it's incredible. It's incredible to sit up here. It's, a, it's an honor. It's a privilege. Um, I. When I get to sit up here and I get to attend these events and I get to see the love and the enthusiasm for this college and for making it successful, it just drives you even further. So I appreciate every single one of you. Um, thank you so much for allowing me to serve. I really appreciate it. Thank you.
Okay, thank you. So we'll be moving on to item 3.2, the annual reorganization of the Board of Trustees nominations for president for the board. I hereby open the floor for nominations for president of the board for 2023-2024. Are there any nominations? Trustee Entuck. I'd like to nominate uh, trust, trust, Vice President Malulu. Okay. Vice President Malulu has a nomination. I second. There's a second by Dr. Baxter. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, then I declare the nominations are closed. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any abstentions? Any opposition? Congratulations, Board President Malaulu. I will now turn the meeting over to our new board president, Malo Ulu, and we then afterwards we'll take a brief moment to switch chairs from the chair. <laughs> thank you, Dr. Munoz, and thank you to my colleagues on the board for once again entrusting me to lead. I sincerely hope that this term as president is smoother than the last. You may recall the last time I was board president, we had a pandemic. So it was a little rough. So I'm, I'm hopeful that uh, things will be a lot smoother this time around and we don't have a global catastrophe. So thank you all, I appreciate the confidence and I look forward to serving. And now we're gonna move on to item 3.3 .3 on the agenda. Oh, actually, this is the... Uh, Nominations for Vice President. I would now like to open the floor for any nominations for Vice President. President Trustee Malu, Chico. I would like to um, nominate Trustee Baxter for Vice President. Second. I have a motion and a second for Dr. Baxter to serve as Vice President. Any discussion? Trustee Zia, did I hear you call my I, name? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, make the motion, and um, but... Uh, I'm fully supportive of this nomination. Um, it gives me great pleasure and honor to cast my vote for my dear friend and um, trustee, Dr. Baxter, to be the vice president. And um, I'll be voting absolutely for this, um, for this uh, agenda item. Thank you for your hard work, Dr. Baxter, your inspiration. Thank you, Trustee Zia. Any other discussion on this item? Madam Secretary, we have a motion and a second. Are we taking a roll call vote? Voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Any abstention? Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, Trustee Baxter. I too am supportive and now we're gonna take about a 60 second recess to rearrange some chairs up here. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate your patience. 
We're gonna move on to item 3.4 on the agenda. This is representative to the Los Angeles County School Trustees Association. This is an action item. I'd like to open the floor for any nominations. You may also self-nominate if you are interested in serving. Trustee Antuck, have you had a, a, an opportunity to serve in this capacity? I have. So have I, and I know Trustee Baxter and I have done it multiple times. I, I think maybe uh, Trustee Chico might be the one <laughs> for LAXA. Everybody on the left has already served multiple terms on that. Would you be our representative? Ginny, did you sabotage this month? <laughs> yes, I will. Excellent. So I'll take a nomination for Trustee Chico, please. Oh, I nominate. I nominate uh, Trustee Chico to serve as our representative to the Los Angeles County School Trustees Association. Second. I, we've got a motion and a second. Trustee Baxter, Trustee Untuck. Any discussion for Trustee Chico to represent us on the LAXA board? Yeah, I, I just want to, President uh, Malaulu, um, just for the, as a point of information, I too have in the past served on this committee oh. and will happily support this nomination. Any other discussion? All right, we've got a motion and a second. Voice vote, please, all those in favor? Aye. Any abstention? And any nays? All right, congratulations, Trustee Chico. Thank you for stepping up to serve us on the LA County School Trustees Association. I've got a whole calendar I could send you. <laughs> We're gonna move on to item 3.5. This is our representative to the LA County Committee on School District Organization. I'll take a motion and a second. I'll, uh, I'll nominate myself for this. Trustee Untuck, is there a second? Second. Trustee Baxter. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Uh, voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstention? Any opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations, Trustee Untuck. You will be representing us on the LA County Committee on School District Organization. Very important job there. We're gonna move on to item 3.6. This is the appointment of additional board member to the audit subcommittee. This is a district subcommittee. Trustee Chico and I both served on that this past year. Any nominations? I would like to serve again. We've got Trustee Chico and we need one more. This is, can, can we appoint one or just the no, two? No, I think I would be doing it. Automatically, okay. All right, we've got a motion for Trustee Chico. A second? Second. Second, any discussion? All right, voice vote, please. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any, excuse me, I didn't call for discussion. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor? Aye. Any Aye. abstention? And anyone opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Trustee Chico, you and I will continue to serve on the audit subcommittee. Thank you. Section four on the agenda, resolutions and recognition, item 4.1, the resolution, Long Beach Housing Promise Cooperation Agreement. This is an action item for the benefit of the public. The resolution is attached to the board doc agenda. And we've got some representatives here that'll be speaking to the board. If you can please come forward. We've got Connor Locke, Deputy Mayor of Housing for the Office of Mayor Rex Richardson. We've got Christopher Reese, Associate Vice President, University Relations at CSULB, and Robert Ayarte. Is Robert here? Yeah, okay. He's a Chief of Staff of District 5 Councilwoman Megan Kerr, so we will miss him. Go ahead and take the floor, please. Thank you, President Malaulu. Thank you, Honorable Trustees, and, and good evening. Uh, thank you for your support of students, housing, our homeless students, uh, food insecure students. There are so many layers. Uh, to making our community a better place to, to be in, a better place to live. So um, I'll be brief, uh, and, and Chief of Staff Robert Ayarte as well uh, sends his regards. He was unable to make it uh, as he has many commitments this evening. But what all of us share at the city and what Mayor Richardson shares for his vision is of a community where all of our partners come together to serve all of our residents, all of our families in the same ways. We're not duplicating effort, we're collaboratively building stronger efforts together, and this cooperative agreement is exactly that. So thank you, Superintendent President Munoz. Thank you, Trustee Chico, for um, being with us at the kickoff ceremony for your words, Superintendent President Munoz. They were inspiring. 
Um, I know we're all very excited to get started, and I really, really want to thank all of you for your dedication to your students. It's better for the whole city, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, as stated, Chris Reese with Cal State Long Beach. On behalf of President Conley, our 40,000 students, faculty, staff, and all of their families, thank you for consideration of this item. Uh, obviously, the work that we have done in the Long Beach College Promise uh, has changed this community, and I hope that we can continue to elevate that with the work that we're going to do around housing our students and their families. Uh, we're really proud to be a partner with you on this. We're really pr proud of the work that we can do together. We've already proven it once. Let's keep going. And that's really what we are here to say tonight. We're happy to be a partner and look forward to continuing the good work. Outstanding. Thank you for your words. At this time, I'd like to open the floor to my colleagues on the board to make comments. Trustee Antuck. Um, I'd like to make a motion to adopt the resolution. Do I have a second? Second. We've got a motion by Trustee Untuck, a second by Trustee Chia, uh, Zia, excuse me. Uh, any discussion on the item? Trustee Untuck? Yeah, thank you. I want to thank uh, both our guests who came, come tonight. Uh, I was not able to attend the ceremony a couple weeks ago, but uh, this is a really important that we're mm -hmm. taking a new direction on housing as far as all the public agencies coming together the Cal State, the City College, the school district, the city. This is kind of really unprecedented in, in our local um, uh, collaboration. We've had a history of collaboration with the College Promise, with internships and job opportunities, but now we're working towards housing, affordable housing, worker housing, student housing, uh, and it's just being able to bring, commingle all of our resources together to do more for the same population that we all serve and our different jurisdictions. Uh, I, I do want to note, and um, there was an event maybe about two months ago about the, the West Side Promise mm -hmm. of looking at uh, West Long Beach as a 10-year investment and targeted community. Um, the California Endowment came about 10 years ago and designated Central Long Beach based on its census codes and poverty levels. Uh, and there were other parts of the city that also West and North said we need uh, resources as well. And I, we've done a great job in North Long Beach bringing resources. And now I think uh, the West Long Beach Promise is a big piece of this. And, and I think as we go forward, and I ask for my colleagues to think about that when we're making final decisions on location and funding, that we can move resources to one of the most neediest communities in the city that's impacted by pollution and traffic and uh, food deserts. Uh, you know, when it's more difficult for students uh, to have housing, it's more difficult to learn. Uh, when students go to school hungry, it's more difficult to learn, and we want all of our students to be successful and graduate and transfer and reach their academic and career goals. So I just ask everyone to vote in favor of this resolution today. Anyone else? Trustee Baxter? I just Vice wanna, President Baxter? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to say I'm, I am so thrilled that we are signing this relationship, this agreement. Uh, Trustee Z and I have been involved for many, many years since 2015 in finding housing for our students. And this just um, elevates the efforts and makes it, I think, hopefully easier to uh, see that we get those um, housing um, factors right away. Thank you. Trustee Zia. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for being here. Um, Connor, um, I have to commend the mayor. He couldn't have picked a better deputy mayor for this position. Um, I am confident in your abilities that this promise is not just made, but it's also kept. And echoing what um, Vice President Baxter, um, Dr. Baxter was just mentioning, um, this is so near and dear to our hearts. We did this with bubble gum and <laughs> um, a rubber band budget, and we were able to support uh, over 1,400 students, many more to come. And um, our staff has been really incredible in really taking it seriously um, and working on housing here. But um, it is, it is in, 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 imperative that we work to make this successful. You have my commitment as a board member yeah, my continued commitment in making sure that this promise is kept and I will whole, wholeheartedly support this action. Trustee Chico. Thank you both for being here. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think you can see that everyone on this board is committed 
uh, and has been committed for some time and dedicated to finding resources to house our um, unsheltered students. Um, I remember uh, I, at least a year ago uh, bringing up the mayor's vision for this Long Beach housing promise and um, saying, you know, we need to continue, we need to strengthen our relationships in working with the other institutions because we serve the same constituencies. And so I'm glad to see this now come to fruition. It was my honor to be there to sign on the MOU, um, uh, advocating for this. So of course, I, I have, um, I will be supportive of this. I also want to um, just acknowledge the work that, um, I see Justin Mendez here in the, in the audience, and the work that he does with um, our mm -hmm. housing insecure and our food insecure students is incredible. And the team that he has at, in our basic needs office um, has really made a difference in the lives of many of our, um, our students. And so I look forward to incorporating that into um, the resources that we offer at, in, in addition to housing. So thank you. Thank you both once again for being here. And I too would like to echo my colleague's sentiment about how uh, timely this resolution is and the agreement is. And we're so grateful for the leadership of our mayor who has really taken the bull by the horns to make sure that this happens. I would also like to take this opportunity to commend Trustee Baxter and Trustee Zia because for many, many years, they have been advocating and fundraising for student housing. So I'm really happy to see that their efforts have reached this level to where we can really move forward with it. And I know that uh, Trustee Baxter and I attended a couple of meetings in the past trying to uh, build partnerships in the community. So it's, it's really nice to see that it's gotten to this point. Uh, Trustee Untuck, you mentioned the West Side. That's where I live. I'm very familiar with that community. I, been there almost 25 years, and it is um, needful. It is a needful effort, and I'm grateful that you're all taking this, taking this uh, uh, approach to build relationships with all of the stakeholders in our community and not just one. And I love what you said, where you said you're not reinventing or starting over, but you're just building on the relationship. So that's awesome. All right, we've got a motion and a second. We've had a robust discussion. Let's go ahead and uh, do a voice vote. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Anyone opposed? All right, motion carries for the resolution. Do we have a photo? Where is the resolution? Oh, excellent. All right, we'll take a picture.
Thank you. We are moving on to item four point, is it two? This is a recognition for the American Criminal Justice Association, Long Beach City College chapter, Sigma Pi. We have guests, please come forward. And forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Richter Klau, Klau, Michael Perlman, and we also have students here who have participated in the competition. Oh, excellent, Professor Mike Biggs, thank you. So I'm gonna read, I have a statement that I need to read, and then we're gonna entertain a motion. Since 1989, the Administration of Justice Program at LBCC had been home to a chapter of the American Criminal Justice Association, ACJA. ACJA is a national organization established in 1937 to further education and professionalism in all aspects of criminal justice. Chapters of this national organization exist on colleges and universities across the country. Every year in both the fall and spring semesters, the organization hosts academic competition conferences. At both competitions this year, the LBCC chapter Sigma Pi was recognized by the organization as a top academic competition team. In October, nine students and two faculty attended the academic competition conference at Fort Hayes State University. In addition to being awarded the Top Academic Team Award, let me say that one more time. In addition to being awarded the Top Academic Team at this competition, the team won 14 additional trophies. Among these 15 awards, the team swept the Criminal Law Academic Competition first, second, third place, and was first place team in an interactive crime scene investigation competition. The hard work of this team has helped bring the administration of justice program at Long Beach City College into the national spotlight. Congratulations and thank you. I move to approve. You make us very proud. I would like to entertain a motion move and a approve. second. We've got second. a motion by Trustee Chico. We've got a second by Trustee Zia. Any discussion on this side? Just want to commend you. You always impress us. And uh, I know the imprimatur of the professors and faculty that we have, that our students are in good hands. So thank you for the work you do. And thank you to the students for participating and making us proud. Trustee Chico. Um, this is really impressive. I mean, this isn't, you know, taking home the, the, it, it's taking home everything. I think mm -hmm. you guys took home all the hardware. So congratulations. Yeah, it right? is Taylor Swift at the Grammys, very <laughs> much so. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you so much for the investment that you're making. Our, our students are benefiting uh, tremendously um, and we're very proud of all of your efforts and accomplishments. Thank you. Do you have anything that you'd like to say? Uh, yeah, I'm uh, Mike Biggs, uh, Madam President and Board. I want to introduce the two advisors that put that trip together, mm. Rick Clough and Mike Perlman, and I'd like Rick to say a few words if we may. Please. Good evening. Um, I want to congratulate our team. Our students, what, what's not seen is the amount of time that they put in. These students stayed late on campus, many times until midnight. This started in August. They worked all of August, all of September. Third week of October is when I, we took our trip and traveled. You're looking at you know, the team of students, but what you don't realize is when we went to this competition, there are universities that show up in tour buses with 50 students in them, and we showed up in our commuter van with our Long Beach City College team, and literally the night before awards, our team was sitting around wondering how many trophies we would win, and as, as the reading said, we've been here for about 35 years on campus. Our average is about five or six trophies per competition, so we guessed we would take about six or seven trophies at this competition, during the awards banquet, they kept calling our name and we kept getting up and getting up. And by the time it was over, it was 15 trophies and we took the top award because of the amount of people we brought and how many trophies that we walked away with. I was getting text messages from faculty members at universities on their way home in their tour buses congratulating us on what a great job we did and how they're really fearful of our team going into the next competition. That's right. So they did a great job. Um, in, in addition to, to what you read, you know, first, 
first place crime scene team, what needs to be understood about that is that's an interactive investigation mm -hmm. where you walk into a room. It was a real crime that originally had occurred, but now it's a mock scenario that the local police homicide detective put together and proctored. So our team walks in and they have 15 minutes in a room to actually process the room. They get 45 minutes in another room to write the report and it's based on how accurate the report is, how in-depth and how good they are at writing mm -hmm. it. And even the officers that proctored the uh, room came out and told other people how great our team did during the investigation process and we took first place in the team crime scene investigation. In addition to, to first... In addition to first, second, and third place in criminal law, which was a complete sweep, we took first place in police administration law. We took second place in corrections law. We took two first place trophies in physical agility and three second place trophies in, third, in physical agility. Um, not to pat ourselves on the back, but your faculty members took second place in correction law against university faculty members, second place in criminal justice knowledge, and third place in criminal law, and obviously the top trophy. We, didn't, we couldn't bring all the trophies in because they wouldn't fit, oh. but um, <laughs> um, I couldn't be more proud of the team and the amount of time that they put in and the dedication um, and you know, four days of traveling to you know, Kansas for this competition. Um, the law enforcement groups that were there were so impressed with our group. I will tell you that, and our members will tell you, the Kansas State Police representatives at the awards banquet, they sat with the members at our table and they were trying to get them to apply to Kansas State Police. <laughs> uh, and that, um, we're not even kidding. So um, congratulations to our team and I appreciate your support. The funding came through uh, the Long Beach City College Foundation, partially, and also the, the CTE uh, grant, the Perkins grant is how we got the money this year. So thank you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. You, you've made us very proud. Uh, our students, you know, we do a lot of recognitions and resolutions, but the best ones are when we recognize our students. So you are absolutely just shining a bright light on LBCC today. And, and I think uh, Dr. Noel and Dr. Douglas are Kansas State alumni, right? Am I, am I correct? Do Dr. Noel, okay, Dr. Corral. So I'm sure you've got one proud alumnus up here. And, you know, I would be remiss not to mention the hard work of the faculty advisors because you are adjunct. So we are particularly grateful for the amount of time and energy that you put into this endeavor. So thank you very much. With that, we've got a motion and a second. So we'll do a voice vote. All those in favor of adopting this resolution? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Congratulations. Would you all please join us for a photo? Thank you.
All right, we're gonna move on to section five on the agenda. We've got our standing report, starting with 5.1, our ASB president report. Is Coco here? I thought I saw you, there you are. Welcome, Coco. Good evening. All right, so to start with my report, our cram night for finals was last night on LAC in the Nordic Lounge from one to five. Our PCC cram night will be in the student union tomorrow from five to 10. So hopefully we'll have a lot of students turn up. We have tutors at the ready. Uh, next Monday, ASB will be hosting a meet and greet in the Nordic Lounge. We'll be having Thai food and asking students to give their feedback and suggestions for next semester. We also awarded over $7,000 in ASB grants this past week to seven clubs. Yes, they will be utilizing those funds for projects. And in our final cabinet meeting of the semester on Monday, we passed four resolutions to put forward to the Student Senate for California Community Colleges. These resolutions advocate for students at the state level in areas of class accessibility, sustainability, college preparedness, and prerequisites. Finally, our ASB retreat is scheduled for February 1st and 2nd. And with that, I wish you all a happy holidays. Thank you very much. Thank you, Coco. Good luck with your finals. Item 5.2, our student trustee report. Uh, student trustee is not with us this evening. 5.3, Academic Senate President, Dr. Jerome Hunt. Good evening, Board President Malu, Superintendent President Munoz, distinguished board members and colleagues. I would like to start off my report by thanking all of our faculty coordinators, committee and subcommittee chairs and department heads. Your tireless work on behalf of your colleagues and students does not go unnoticed. Um, I have a few updates to share uh, tonight. First, in terms of the honors program, the honors program has successfully recruited over 100 students to be part of the honors program beginning in the spring semester. 40% uh, of those students identify as Latinx, 18% identify as Black African American, and 2% identify as Native American. It's great to see that the diversity of our honors program is continuing to grow. In terms of student equity, I uh, want to let everyone know that applications for the 2024-2025 student equity mini grants are now open and they will close on February 29th of next year. Department and areas of the college as well as individual faculty, staff, and student clubs can apply for these grants ranging from $100 to $5,000. The Student Equity Subcommittee is asking that all mini grant proposals aim to closely, uh, I'm sorry, aim to close the equity or obligation gap for one or more of our disproportionately impacted student groups along one or more of the metrics that we have laid out in our 2022-2025 student equity plan, namely Native American, Black African American, and first generation students. Uh, the committee is particularly interested in proposals that seek to address student engagement, connection, belonging, and mattering with a focus on black African American and first generation students. In terms of our student learning outcomes, the assessment for student learning outcomes subcommittee has released the SLO faculty development shell, which functions as both a course repository of resources to allow full-time and part-time faculty to learn everything they need to know about SLOs at LBCC. Additionally, a technical review has been conducted of over 140 courses uh, in their program learning SLOs this semester alone to keep our curriculum up to date and our assessment efforts intentional. Uh, finally, in terms of the cultural curriculum audit, uh, it has been rebranded and is now known as the LBCC Equitable Teaching Community or ETC or Community, however you want to refer to it as. Uh, interest forms to take part in the ETC were made available on Monday and I'm happy to report within 24 hours the ETC program was at capacity. So we have a cohort of 40 equity-minded full and part-time instructors who will begin their work in mid-January. So in conclusion, I would like to wish everyone a restorative and restful break if you are able to take one, and happy holidays to everyone. And that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hunt. Item 5.4 on the agenda, Classified Senate President. This is Benjamin Chase. Thank you. I think, okay, Dara has the presentation. So these are the photos we talked about at the last board meeting, but I just want to make sure we took a chance to show off all the great things we did this semester. So I just wanna kind of refresh everyone's mind on the classified connection events we did 
Starting in the summer, we did a women's, U.S. Women's World Cup game watch at Dave & Buster's. We followed that up with our classified Senate retreat. Uh, it was the first time for all of us to come together in almost four years in person for it, so it was a great start point for us this semester. I said we had followed that up with a Hollywood Bowl concert for Quincy Jones' birthday. Um, we had the meetup at College Day. Uh, we had a women's water polo game watch that Herlinda Chico was able to attend with us as well, so thank you again for doing that. Um, at homecoming, great turnout for them. Unfortunately, the football game didn't go the way we wanted to for that one. Uh, leadership excellence nominee luncheon that we had at the bistro for some of our candidates for that award. Um, we had classified family night with the women's volleyball team, our great Halloween event for campus-wide activity, um, a classified Senate council lunch. I said, and then we just did a week ago our classified, not classified, men's basketball game watch for it. And I just wanna show we're 3-0 and in all of the times that we showed up to support our team. So we look forward to continuing the trend in the spring semester as well for it. And so the event you're seeing there was just the Hollow Hollow Social. Go ahead, Dario, for it. And then we had, they were making Christmas lanterns or parole for it. It was really cool activity for us to come together. I was just watching because that's not my skill set for it. Next slide for it. And as you can see tonight, I'm wearing my Viking jersey as well. Um, great thing about this event, this was Cerritos High School for it. And it was awesome to see the local high school kids showing off our LBCC gear as well. Thank you to James Seha and Jonathan Tejada for representing us there. Next slide for it. And this you can see, for those of you that did not get a chance to come or didn't see the videos or anything else, you can see the classified Senate at the Halloween party there. Um, you can see our colleague Ariane Lee, her team at the library won the best group for it, and she was a ketchup bottle, just in case you couldn't make that out for it. I said, and you can't see me so much in this one, but I do have on my red pants and red shoes, so if anybody knows, I actually was being Papa Smurf, I just wasn't in blue face for it. Um, but since I was helping support and be a, I called it VJ for the day for it, so anybody that knows MTV for it, because my office team was the 80s, so it was my point of ode to them in kind of a combination for it. And uh, next slide for it, and this is part of the team that Jonathan Tejada is the big good luck Care Bear in that outfit for it. I said, not necessarily the best day to be having that on, but it was still was an awesome time we had for it. Next one, and this was the Classified Senate Council Choice Award winners for it. Brenda Ramos is the Scarecrow. Um, Tiffany Hoon as our Princess Peach for it. Their group also did an 80s theme, but theirs was um, more specific to uh, comics, cartoons, and video games for it. I said, and then my colleague Donna Mendoza is our Cabbage Patch Kid, which was awesome. One of the most incredible, like for me, took me back to my childhood for sure for it. Next slide for it. Super awesome event for Dio de los Muertos for it. Um, the ofrenda you see is actually from my enrollment services colleagues for it. I said it was a really nice tribute. Um, we've had some folks that we lost this year, so it was a great time to come out and for us to be part of the march and procession over and celebrate for that. Next slide. And then it's just showing you more pictures from the day when we set it up to what it then looked at at night, the candles and everything going. Next slide for it. Um, I'm wearing, I was hopeful Emma was here. I wanted to thank her. She came by my office when I wasn't there to relieve because I wasn't able to attend the kickoff event, but she did bring me a bracelet for um, from them that um, it says on it, no more stolen sisters for it, supporting that. I said, and so it was critical for me to acknowledge and thank her for doing that and coming to see me for it. I said, I missed her today for it, but I appreciate her for that in the Heritage Month that we just celebrated for it. Next slide. And so this is where I wanted to spend a couple of minutes quickly because I wanted to congratulate all of my awesome colleagues for their service and leadership and that it was recognized by their fellow colleagues. So each person you see listed here, Lulu Tupua Amante, myself, Jonathan Tejada, Teddy Titus, Susan Fitland, Jimmy Flowers, Stephanie Bonales, and Andrew Chavez were all nominated by their fellow colleagues to receive the Legal Excellence Award, which is a really incredible turnout and response for us. I don't think we've ever had that kind of response. We also had another colleague nominate a faculty member as well, so I had nine folks that went out of their way to make sure that we recognize our fellow colleagues, which a critical thing when we talk about belonging at Long Beach City College, that we are acknowledging one another. And so it was critical for us to share that. The next slide, to me, this was a special thank you to Malcolm Elliott, Ariane Lee, 
Uh, Annette Mullenix is not listed on here, but she was the one nominating a faculty member. Stephanie Banales, Doug Wood, Cece Sadler, Angela Folks, Rebecca Lucas, and Pamela Brackman, because they went out of their way to make sure their colleagues were acknowledged and thanked for their service. I said, this is a critical thing for me because we do things day in and day out, and you don't always necessarily get the recognition for it, but the fact that people saw us, and it wasn't necessarily the colleague working right next to you, it was people from different departments, different areas, different campuses, in making sure that we got acknowledgement from that. And so I appreciate all of them and thank them. We did do a certificate of recognition for each of our nominees, and we did a certificate of appreciation from the Classified Senate for each of our nominators for it. I'm hopeful to continue. We did one lunch already for a group of four of the nominees at the Bistro. It just makes it a little difficult when half of our folks are at PCC to try to schedule the time for it. Thank you, everybody, for that. I will finish. One last thing. I know my time's probably up. We are at 6 oh, oh, okay. It's, okay. It's, Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate your report. I just want to be mindful of the time and keep it fair to everyone else. But you do provide excellent graphics and a good report, so thank you. Item 5.5 on the agenda, LBCCFA Bargaining President Report, Suzanne Englehart. Good evening and uh, congratulations Board uh, President Malaulu and Board Vice President uh, Baxter and uh, thank you for your service this past year, uh, Board Trustee Chico. Um, I want to first congratulate our negotiations team for a job well done and I want to thank the district for their work. Um, and for bringing us all together to uh, TA. And um, so we're looking for ratifying that contract. And um, the remainder of my time, and I wanna say to everyone, have a happy holiday. I am with you, Ben, to ask, hope everyone gets a time to relax and disengage. And then um, I wanna take the remainder of my time to introduce our um, faculty member, um, as you all know here with all the trophies, uh, Mike Biggs. He's gonna share some about his uh, department. Okay, I'm having a pretty good day, all right? <laughs> but I, first of all, I wanna say uh, congratulations to uh, our new president and vice president on the board, uh, President Munoz. Very nice of you to, to be here and participate with us. Um, <clears throat> this is one of those uh, good days where I get to brag about my department. Now we have three major programs in the public services department. Social work, new to the college this fall, we have the fire science program and the administration of justice program, which you've seen a bit about tonight. Now, the social work program uh, was spearheaded by Professor Sherry Galvanized, who put a new curriculum together over the past several months. She is very close to launching an ADT in social work. We're very close to kicking off a field experience class that she has been the driving force behind. And this program is one of the premier helping field uh, educational opportunities. The people in this program are dedicated to public service and they're doing a great job. The students are marvelous. Uh, uh, Sherry Galvanized is an excellent professor. And if you're at PCC, you might see her skating around the campus. That's one of her hobbies and exercise and I think she's kind of getting known for it, but I'm gonna caution you, don't get in her way, <laughs> all right? It could, be, it could be problematic for you. Now, our, our fire program uh, has two uh, full-time instructors, Chief Brad Wilson and Chief Frank Hayes, and we have one adjunct uh, instructor who is a retired captain from the Orange County Fire Authority. Chief Hayes and Chief Wilson are retired from the Long Beach Fire Department, and Chief Wilson was the deputy chief there for several years. They bring a tremendous amount of experience and credibility to our program. So much so that the students that they are training uh, have done well. We have a, a large number of them employed currently in the local area and outside the state. And currently we have eight of our recent graduates in the cohort at the Long Beach Fire Department right now. They're doing a, a, just a terrific job. Uh, not only are they training our students well, but they're giving us a lot of uh, connectivity to the Long Beach Fire Department. And we've got several irons in the fire, no pun intended, to better our program and the assistance with the city. Now, when we go to the Administration of Justice program, 
I'm standing here as the full-time instructor. Uh, we're, we've got a new position approved. We're gonna be moving forward in the spring, hopefully to, to gather another uh, quality person to bring into our program. But the quality of our adjunct instructors, as uh, demonstrated tonight by Rick Clough and Mike Perlman, all of our adjuncts are retired professionals from the field. That gives them credibility with our students. Our students have gone on to uh, tremendous things. We've had a naval officer uh, come out of our program. We've had a former chief of police in Long Beach uh, that came out of our program. They're doing a wonderful job and uh, deserve our cr uh, congratulations. I wanna close uh, with uh, some of the work that our programs student service clubs are involved in. Each one of them uh, uh, works with a charity. Our social work program is working with the blanket and toy drive through CalWORKS. The fire department, uh, our fire science program is working with the Long Beach Fire Department, Chair Christmas Spark of Life Charity, and our Administration of Justice program works with Long Beach PD in their Widows and Orphans Fund. So uh, it's great work all around. Thank you all for giving us the opportunity to, to be here and wish you all a happy holiday. Thank you for that, Professor Briggs. <laughs> Item 5.6 on the agenda, AFT Bargaining President Report, Robert Remetta. Good evening, President Malalulu, Superintendent Nunez, and esteemed board members, members of the dais, and the member of the community that are watching tonight. Thank you so much for letting me speak on the behalf of the classified. Um, as we come to the end of the year, all the classified are proud of the hard work we've done to help our LBCC students thrive. Our goal continues to be to create an environment where students can be successful in their full future endeavors. From the administrative assistants to the web developers and all the AFT members working hard at LBCC, we wanna wish the community a happy holiday season and thank you for all your hard work as well. Thank you. Thank you. Now we're going to go to item 5.7, which is the Chai Bargaining President Report. Crystal? Crystal Huckabee, come on up. Good evening, members of the board, Superintendent Munoz. Um, congratulations to President Malaulu and Vice President Baxter. And also good evening to all the esteemed members of the dais and community members watching. On behalf of CHAI, I am pleased to share that we have come to a tentative agreement with the district, uh, of course, pending ratification. So I just want to say that I hope the forward motion that we've made over the last year and a half is not lost. I know that on behalf of our part-timers, the um, MOUs that we um, have tentatively agreed upon are really important to us, um, paid office hours, healthcare benefits. Um, we would love to see these um, stay on permanently. And um, I look forward to continuing our um, positive growth um, with between Chai and the district. Um, I also wanna take a moment to uh, remind our part-time faculty who might be watching online um, to apply for unemployment, last day of the semester is coming up, just a friendly reminder. And I would like to wish everyone a happy and safe break. I hope everyone gets the rest that we all so very need. Um, I'd also like uh, to give the mic to Karen for a few words. Good evening. As lead negotiator of uh, CHAI, I, you, know, you know we have accepted the district's last package proposal have wrapped up negotiations. Um, I just wanna thank Loy Nishua and his team, uh, Kristen, Sonia, Javier, and of course, Juliet. Um, I figured we were getting close to finishing when Loy started offering us snacks. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I also want to thank the Chai team, Lawrence, Dale, and of course our CTA staff, Angel. After many, many months of hard work, we have a tentative agreement we can be proud of. I think our last few sessions with Loy and his team were very productive, and both sides were able to be flex enough to finish strong. Uh, we look forward to working with the district as we roll out the new MOU on healthcare benefits. 
and the MOU on the long-awaited and highly anticipated part-time faculty office hours. We know we've had a few dedicated su supporters of part-time faculty office hours, and so we just want to thank you for that. It's been a long time coming, and I, man, I thought I was going to die before that ever happened. <laughs> so I'm really excited. Um, and we appreciate the increases in committee stipends and the creative thinking around COLA for the next few years. So it's time to let the part-time faculty begin enjoying the benefits of a new collective bargaining agreement. Before you know it, it will be time to sunshine again, but I think we can rest on our, our laurels for a hot minute or so. <laughs> Happy holidays to all of you, thanks. Thank you everyone who provided a report. We're gonna move on to section six on the agenda, our superintendent president report. Thank you. Good evening, Board of Trustees and campus community. It is my pleasure to give you my report for the month of December. So we received some exciting news from faculty member John Sicklick last month that nearly 70 LBCC students participated in the National Cyber League Collegiate Cybersecurity Competition. LBCC ranked in the top 13% of, out of, excuse me, 521 colleges and universities throughout the nation. The National Cyber League enables students to prepare and test themselves against practical cybersecurity challenges that they will likely face in the workforce. We all certainly know how important it is in today's age, and we are very excited for the future of these students. And a big thank you to John, Jason Hillman, and Garrett Whelan for assisting our students through the competition. Let's give them a big round of applause. Another opportunity, I know we were able to recognize them earlier, but I wanted to include them in my report as well. A huge congratulations is due to our Administration of Justice and American Criminal Justice Association. The service club, long known as Sigma Pi, in October, they competed at Fort Hayes State University in Kansas for four days. Um, as you know, our students racked up a lot of trophies and we're extremely proud of them. I want to also acknowledge and extend my appreciation to our adjunct faculty, Rick Clough and Mike Perlman, for working so closely with our students for their exceptional performance. Let's give them another round of applause as well. I mean, it's just award season here at Long Beach City College. So LBCC alum, Dr. Blas Villalobos. Let's see if the new slide changes. Dario, is it gonna, there we go. LBCC alum Dr. Blas Villalobos received the prestigious California Community College Distinguished Alumni Award for 2023 from the Community College League of California last month. He is a decorated military hero and a true community college success story. We are so proud that he is a product of LBCC. I was honored to join Long Beach Mayor Rex Richardson former board president Chico, Dr. Jane Close Connolly, president of Cal State Long Beach, and Dr. Jill Baker, superintendent, president, superintendent of schools at Long Beach Unified School District, to sign a new memorandum of understanding between our institutions. The Long Beach Housing Promise will support the creation of affordable housing pathways for students. This will be one more innovative way we can break down barriers in the name of student success through strategic collaboration and advocacy with our city and educational partners. Once again, Long Beach City College had a large turnout. I have to say, I think our parade game is really strong. We had one of the largest turnouts for the annual Belmont Shore Christmas Parade. Let's check out this quick video from last Saturday's celebration. We're here in Area 4 at the Belmont Shore Christmas Parade with our cheer team, with our employees, and their families. It's such a great event. As you could see, our parade entry included our board members, LBCC carolers, our national champion cheer squad, the children and families of the LBCC Child Development Centers, student athletes, presidents, ambassadors, and employees. 
It was a great night to represent LBCC in front of thousands of people in Belmont Shore. I was told there was over 10,000 people that attended the parade. And so I just wanna say, you know, I know there's a lot of effort and planning that goes into these parades, but it's so important for us to be visible and connected with our communities. You see, um, if, if you ever have a chance to walk in the parade, as you're walking through, you see the engagement with folks and how excited they are to see Long Beach City College represent. So again, thank you to everyone who participated. Um, if you weren't able to join us at the Belmont Shore Parade, you have two more chances to participate in some upcoming parades. This Saturday, we have the Daisy Lane Parade. And if you've never walked down with a, or walked with us down the Daisy Lane, you're in for a real treat. Um, I personally love seeing tons of families celebrating in front of their homes and neighbors sitting out shoulder to shoulder and the medians along the sidewalks for the parade. This is truly one of my favorite events of the year. So if you'd like to join us, um, it's this Saturday. The parade kicks off at 5 p.m. and we would love to have you. We also will have, um, we'll also be participating in the Martin Luther King Jr. Parade and Celebration in Central Long Beach on January 13th. Everyone is invited to join us as we once again march together to play tribute or to pay tribute to Dr. King and support his inspirational legacy of equity and inclusion for all. There are gonna be some amazing, I've seen the shirt designs for MLK Parade and they're awesome, so I really encourage folks to come out. Um, you can find the details in our weekly e-newsletter in the loop. Some other positive news, we recently heard that we received a grant from the Aspen Institute. Out of 144 applicants, LBCC was one of six colleges chosen to receive $50,000 from the Parent Powered Solutions Fund. This funding will help the college integrate student parent voices into services that support them and strengthen their sense of belonging on campus. Um, a big, I think there's, it's an invisible population student parents and it's important that we really honor them and bring them into the discussions on how to create a more inclusive campus for them. So we're really looking forward to this work. And today we launched our free yoga on the lawn session today. So now moving forward every Wednesday at noon, our campus community will come together along with our, commu our greater community at large to enjoy some yoga, bring out your mat, your water. It's from noon, PM, noon to 1 p.m. Today we had 25 students, employees, and community members participate. Um, if anybody's ever test attended yoga on the bluff, um, I live kind of in that area. You see hundreds of people out there every day at noon doing yoga. Well, we're hoping to replicate that here at Long Beach City College on this side of town. So I think it'll be a great way for our students, our employees, our faculty, um, as well as our community, local community to connect and you know, just spend some time in community. Before I close, I wanna take a moment of personal privilege. We have a birthday in the house, and I know she's probably gonna be like, don't do it, but I'm gonna do it because I'm corny like that. I wanna acknowledge our new Dean of Student Affairs, Deb Miller-Calvert, it is her birthday. So, happy birthday, feliz cumpleaños, all of it, we are so, Grateful to have you here at Long Beach City College and just want to wish you a happy birthday. So just in closing, I want to take the time to wish all of you a safe and relaxing and enjoyable holiday. Um, it's really been an incredible 2023. I can't believe we made it through halfway of the school year. And so I'm just really excited and we look forward to an amazing 2024. So thank you everyone and this concludes my report. Thank you very much, Dr. Munoz. We're gonna move on to section seven on the agenda. We have two presentations today. The first one, item 7.1, is the 2022-23 District Annual Audit, Measure E-2008 and Measure LB-2016 Performance Audit and Measure E-2008 and Measure LB-2016 Financial Audit Presentation. Uh, just for the benefit of the public, Trustee Chico and I have met with the audit team multiple times throughout the course of the semester, and we are very confident that the team has done a very thorough job. So I would like to turn the floor over to Dr. Raymond Chip West. He's Vice President of Business Services. He will introduce CWDL Certified Public Accountants to give a report on the 2022-23 District Annual Audit Report. Thank you, Board President Malulu. Uh, we're really excited to have tonight with us John Dominguez from CWDL to share kind of the audit information. Go ahead, John. Yeah, thank you. Uh, as mentioned, we had a chance to meet with the Board Audit Subcommittee and go through all of those reports in great detail. And so we just wanted to come forward tonight and bring some highlights and share some of the really good news and good results we had um, from all of those audits. Um, so with that, we'll just kind of briefly walk through kind of the services and deliverables 
a brief uh, summary of the components that make up those audited financial statements, a summary of the results, a few key highlights, and then a summary, uh, as mentioned, of the bond audits. And so beginning with those services and deliverables, uh, we've been engaged to audit uh, the district's annual financial statements, and that includes uh, the compliance with both federal and state components, and then also performing the Measure E and Measure LB financial and performance audits, all for the period ending June 30th of 23. And in that district uh, audit financial statements, one of the four opinions that we render is our independent auditor's report. And so we discussed, uh, again, with the audit subcommittee, uh, that the uh, opinion we've rendered uh, is generally uh, considered the unmodified opinion, not an official term, but uh, kind of the best opinion at our disposal. And essentially what that means is that the financial data presented to us by management that we performed all of our audit procedures over, we felt was very accurate, was very complete, uh, and we did not have uh, adjustments or need any uh, changes to that information. And it also agreed uh, to what was presented to the state chancellor's office. So very, very good financial results there. Uh, and then uh, we walked through the report again in detail, kind of uh, the management's discussion and analysis uh, has some excellent information, more in narrative form, uh, presenting some of the financial uh, data, the basic financial statements we walked through, including the statement of net position, revenues, expenses, and changes in net position, uh, and various other elements seen there. Uh, the remaining financial information included the notes, some required supplementary information, uh, as well as our other independent auditor's report. Uh, and the district also includes uh, some continuing disclosure information, which is uh, some supplemental uh, items in the report. And uh, what we have here is a summary of our auditor's results. So I mentioned that first opinion on the financials. Uh, here we have the summary of our opinion on federal compliance, state compliance, and internal control over financial reporting and compliance. And we did not identify uh, any instances of noncompliance, both for federal and state, uh, nor did we identify any deviations and controls uh, that would rise to the level of a significant deficiency or a material weakness. Uh, so continuing uh, with those very positive results uh, that, that we saw there on the financial opinion. A few key financial highlights. Uh, the net position did increase by 43 million for the district. Uh, the fund balance as a whole for all funds increased by $5 million. Uh, the primary expenditures being salary and benefits increased to a total of $170 million. Uh, we saw also an increase in capital assets uh, and uh, receivables as well, increasing by $14 million, being driven primarily by uh, apportionment, student activity, and then some other construction project receivables as well. And on the liability side, we did see an increase in the long-term liabilities of 24 million. And one of our uh, probably lengthier items of discussion I just wanted to, to bring forward and mention was on the district's proportionate share of uh, the CalSTRS and CalPERS uh, pension systems. Uh, so as, as you may recall, and it's been discussed in the past, both of those systems do remain significantly underfunded, and the district is required annually to recognize its proportionate share of those liabilities. And so we just pointed out that as of June 30th of 23, uh, the CalSTRS component increased in liability from 43.5 million in the prior year to 64. 0.75 in the current period, and on the PERS side, it had been 53.5, and that increased to 87.38 million in the current period. So you can see some significant increases, combined total of 55 million on those liabilities. And then the volatility of the pension systems was, was also something uh, that we spent some time going through. Uh, and so as you see here in the middle column uh, for each system, uh, STRS being on top, PERS on bottom, shows the current uh, liabilities uh, as they stand as of reporting period June 30th of 23. Uh, and if uh, the actuarially determined discount rates are not met by the tune of 1%, you can see on the left-hand side that decrease amount, how significant those liabilities can increase. And obviously in a scenario where there's some positive, uh, favorable uh, deviations from those expected discount rates, you can see those go down. But just wanted to provide that context uh, that those are very, very volatile uh, liabilities and they are significant. And again, the district simply taking its proportionate share properly reflected all those. Uh, so great discussion we had with the, the subcommittee on those items. And then finally, concluding with the bond financial and performance audits uh, for both uh, Measure E and LB, uh, we had gone through, uh, there were no expenditures for, for Measure E. As you know, they have the remaining authorization 
uh, that will be strategically uh, utilized at some point uh, as it's appropriate based on assessed valuations. And then Measure LB had the 15 million in expenditures and we tested roughly 60% of those and uh, concluded that all of those uh, expenditures that were examined uh, were allowable, both under uh, the guise of Proposition 39, uh, state requirements, uh, as well as uh, the ballot language that was put out to the voters. So uh, excellent results, uh, both on compliance and financial reporting. Uh, and with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have about any of the audits. Any questions? Trustee Antuck? Hey, thank you for, so much for your presentation. And a few questions. On the CalSTRS and, and CalPERS liability disclosure, there was a law change a couple years ago to change the reporting of that. Can you, I don't know if you're aware, if you can share any background. Yeah, exactly. So historically, if we look back before that change, uh, the one I'm uh, thinking of specifically is actually uh, the, the financial reporting change. Those liabilities didn't exist on the district's financials whatsoever. Uh, you simply just recognize kind of pay as you go, uh, those annual employer contributions. And so it was a change in GASB requirement to bring on the district share of those liabilities. Uh, so you're exactly right. That was a significant change uh, that was brought on fairly recently. I mean, that was a, a general accounting practice update, but was there a law change as far as um, increased contributions? Yes, exactly. So when we talk about the unfunded portions, uh, you know, the way those are solved is by increasing uh, the required contribution, the employer contribution. So if we look back, you know, roughly 10 years ago, both STRS and PERS were single digit uh, percentage of employer contribution requirement. They've now both more than doubled. And you know, we just bring up that volatility just to, to kind of put a little perspective on it that ultimately to fund both of those systems, it is gonna be you know, largely employer contributions meeting those employee contributions as well, but you know, the significant portion falling to the employer. Great, last, last question, thank you so much. Uh, on the, our, our bonds, I know we stagger our distribution and, and bonds are like getting a, a loan that we you know, say we, you know, this is example was $15 million, we build something, and over time we pay it back through our property assessments. Um, what's our remaining value on E and LB, uh, if, you, if, you're, if you have it with yeah. you, uh, that's remaining that you went, that was on your presentation? You know, know, we there was one was zero, and one was 15 million. Yeah, exactly, so we had actually added that, that was at the recommendation of uh, members of uh, the audit subcommittee to include uh, that additional authorization. So it's in the full report um, that I can maybe stumble my way through as I uh, talk slowly, um, uh, but we did include that in the report. So in, in both of those formal issuances with the full reports, those are in there. Yeah. I didn't stumble quick enough, so <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. Trustee Untuck, it sounded like you were volunteering to be on the subcommittee. Did I, did I miss that? I have served for more than three years on the <laughs> subcommittee in the past. Trustee Chico, were you going to say something? There you go. I was, and thank you so much for raising uh, that question, Trustee Antuk. Um, it was something that we felt was really important to highlight. Um, and, and the expanded, the very thorough explanation is in the report, um, but but we want people to, to see it. We want people to know that it is a little volatile. Uh, it's a really important piece of information as we move forward um, in, in all of our budgets. So thank you so much for all the work that you sure. did. Sure, and I do have those figures for you. Uh, the Measure E has a remaining authorization of just over 151 million and Measure LB has just over 488 million in remaining voter approved auth authorizations. Thank you. Okay, Superintendent President Munoz. You know, I just really want to take a moment to acknowledge, well, first of all, thank you, obviously, in the work that y'all did as the external auditors, but I really want to commend Dr. Chip West and his team, John Thompson, Conrado's here. Um, they've done a really great job. I think when I was at the league, there was conversations, a couple weeks ago when I was at the league, there was conversations that um, there's been like an increase statewide of audit findings at different institutions and you think about coming out of the pandemic, certain th people got lax with things, you layer in HERF and all the compliance with HERF dollars, the millions of dollars that colleges have been getting. Some schools found themselves with issues mm -hmm. and the fact that we don't have those issues here and we've been able to maintain all of our internal controls in a strong way, I think says a lot about the team and so I just wanna publicly acknowledge them and their work, so thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Munoz. Anyone else? Okay, Dr. West, please. Yeah, I also wanted to thank the team. You know, it's it's uh, it's a pretty solid fiscal team that we have here, and you should be very proud. John Thompson, obviously our um, our director, but also Conrado is here today. He's the one that does the lion's share of the reporting and the back and forth with this. And we really have an outstanding team in the entire office. The manager Sem Cho. Um, uh, Karina Serrano, and then all of our accountants. Uh, I do want to say, just to echo what you said, Dr. Munoz, HERF really did trip up a lot of folks this year. And, you know, here at LBCC, a lot of people had their hands in HERF and did really great jobs all the way through. I want to really recognize uh, Dana Fries and Interim VP Enficino, who early on kind of led some of our HERF efforts. Bob Repose is here and his team really kind of took it on. And then Karina Serrano who really brought us home. So it was a it was from one group to that, the pass off from each one of those groups to really bring us through into a really clean audit is really commendable. So I just wanted to recognize them. Thank you. Thank you. I too would like to thank Dr. West and your entire team. And John, thank you. I know you have a long drive home, so appreciate it. Uh, also, I, and if I start naming off one name, I'm gonna be remiss and, and miss because I know there's a whole team in that department. So thank you all very much for the hard work you do. The audit happens every year and they start tonight. When he goes home, he's gonna start working on next year's audit. So you can take tonight off because you have a long commute, <laughs> but tomorrow morning, you know, we'll work on 2024. So thank you it. very much for thank being you. here. All right, um, item 7.2 is our bond measure presentation. Alfred, is it Freijo? 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 Welcome. Thank you. Alfred is, uh, this is an information item only. He is representing the SOMOS group and he'll discuss our bond measure. Thank you, good evening, uh, Chair and Honorable Trustees. It's a pleasure to be here and especially happy that I get to follow a, a clean audit. That's always a good thing. Um, uh, as was mentioned by our Honorable Madam Chair, uh, I will present uh, purely informational uh, data for you all and a bit of guidance as we embark on what I believe is an important uh, endeavor um, for the college. I have to say first that it's a thrill to be with you um, as I have previously served the district uh, in my capacity as real estate uh, and uh, public finance council as well. I have over 20 uh, years of experience uh, working in this space as a lawyer. I have a team of attorneys that are really focused on representing institutions that are mission driven. So it's truly an honor to be with you today and to be able to assist in this important process. Uh, in addition to that, after serving in big law for a very long time, I launched my own practice that's minority owned, LGBTQ and women led. Um, so that's very important to me. And uh, I say that with uh, tremendous gratitude for this body to having selected us as part of your bench. So with that opening, uh, I will proceed with my presentation today. Really, uh, the opportunity is to provide an overview on some of the uh, scope of uh, restrictions, but really also the authority that you have as a board to uh, engage in conversations about a uh, proposed measure that uh, should you elect to place on the ballot, um, it brings with it a number of uh, uh, regulatory structures that must be adhered to. And as I mentioned, this is really a beginning of a conversation my hope is that I can continue to advise the board as it relates to specific activities that might be proposed, considered, and ultimately launched. Um, I'll start by talking a bit about the overarching legal structure. Uh, as a lawyer, that's uh, of paramount to me, and as an office uh, that's focused on advising public institutions, we are up to speed on some of the changes in the law. Uh, second, we'll talk about the fundamental aspects of the duty of impartiality and then proceed with the scope of permitted and uh, restricted activities. And then um, I'll take uh, a, a bit of uh, personal privilege and talk a little bit about some of the questions that were raised by the board and hopefully um, conclude with uh, some next steps and uh, guidance from you all on how I can continue to be um, helpful and effective as counsel. So first, what are we talking about in terms of framework? Um, as you all know, uh, as a public institution, you are governed by uh, both the government code and the education code. 
The government code is the one that sets uh, some foundational uh, rules uh, governing the functions of uh, the preparation of bond measures. The uh, education code really is the one that, that provides very specific protocols on board activity and uh, district activity that uh, may be undertaken both, both uh, prior to the uh, adoption of a resolution to introduce the ballot measure, what we refer to as pre-election, and then also um, during the election process. The Political Reform Act is another important statutory body that uh, we evaluate as it relates to providing advice to you all. Um, and then as important is the Attorney General opinions. And there have been actually a number of very recent opinions that I think are relevant and inform the recommendations I'll be making today. Um, case law, of course, is a critical aspect of our compliance diligence. Um, we are monitoring recent case law particularly as it relates to the way that the courts have defined this duty of impartiality, which um, is, uh, as I mentioned, the, the foundational aspect, aspects of what governs activity for the board. As a general matter, public funds or resources may not be used uh, to advocate for the passage or the rejection of any bond measure. And I mention that as a general rule with the understanding that this board has not uh, elected to proceed with the bond measure at this juncture. You have invested with your fantastic team, uh, Dr. West included, with uh, undertaking a series of investigations and diligence that relates to a possible measure. That work and expenditure of funds to engage the best team to advise the board on a potential decision all of those uh, commitments of public resources are absolutely permissible. Um, and it's important to recognize that the work that goes to, for instance, um, with research and surveys on the kind of language that might be appropriate to best advocate for the best interest of the district is absolutely allowed. What we're referring to here is really as it relates to when the board votes and adopts a resolution, should you, should, should you do that, for the uh, submittal of a measure um, with the registrar's office at the county, um, what actual activity can you do? So at that moment, the board is obligated to maintain that impartiality. District employees may engage in public informational non-advocacy activity where such activity is part of their duties and uh, is authorized by their supervisor. So what that means is really that the scope of activity that might be undertaken to promulgate impartial data or information as it relates to that measure has to be within the scope of authorized uh, activity of that uh, professional that is either uh, an employee or an elected official. We'll talk about um, some of the activity that the board itself could do um, that might be appropriate as part of your existing uh, authority and function. Any informational materials must also be impartial. And this is an area that we often work very closely with your staff in preparing the kinds of materials, documentations, where there might be presentations and the like, so that they are not only um, impartial in the four corners of the documentation that's prepared, but also that you're able to demonstrate through the administrative record that you've paid attention to the necessary requirements, you've consulted with competent counsel as it relates to the rules that require impartiality, and you've vetted those internally and have robust internal systems that you can point to should there be any investigation associated with the kind of work. And that extends both to what the board might be doing as it relates to your own activities as uh, public officials, it relates to your executive cabinet and what they might be doing in conversations with the public. And then of course it relates to staff and what they might be doing both in their official capacity but also in their free time. Employees should be informed in anticipation of a potential decision by this board and cautioned as it relates to making sure that notwithstanding the rules and staying within the framework of what I mentioned, that statutory framework, that there might be a perception of impartiality. And sometimes the perception of impartiality, it could be as controversial 
and uh, as damaging to the, the good work that the district is doing as actual imp uh, impartiality. And so we wanna make sure that we are balancing both practical aspects of perception as well as those legal requirements. The board, the superintendent, and the employees may not engage in advocacy while they're on district jobs. Um, we know that in this dynamic workplace, there are activities that happen both on-site and off-site, and paying due diligence on the kinds of activities that might be um, uh, engaged in by, by your workforce is really critical. And I say that also with a, um, with a sense that it is really a balancing act. We have to be somewhat practical about truly what um, ultimately the scope of your supervision of your workforce, but also making sure, as I mentioned, that to the extent that we have the infrastructure in place and the right education, and I would uh, argue the necessary training for your workforce uh, work, uh, on these issues, I think you can rest comfortably that you will be operating within the confines of what's permissible. Finally, in, in regards to this issue of impartiality, personal advocacy should be premised with a clear public statement by the district that the employee, in this case, um, whoever is active in participating in some forum or attending a rally or attending a you know, small a salon with individuals, that that, in, that person is acting in their personal capacity um, and then has a necessary documentation to support that. One obvious thing is um, engaging in activity after the working hours, over the weekend, um, in events that are not sanctioned uh, specifically by the district, et cetera. What are the permitted activities that we're talking about, to be a bit more precise? The permissive, permitted activities, uh, you should think about them in two ways, and this is uh, from a temporal standpoint. The first is the pre-election work that the district needs to do. This is a necessary investment in resources, both as it relates to um, the facilities, um, the staff time, the expenditure uh, in retaining experts uh, as it relates to the investigation of the ballot. Those activities we call pre-election activities. Those are allowed, of course, as I mentioned previously. The list of activities that you see in this presentation is as it relates to the election phase. This is after you've made the decision considering the facts that you want to proceed with a ballot measure. Um, these activities should be, as I mentioned, subject to thorough review by your executive team as well as your council. You may, as I mentioned, prepare and distribute informational materials that talk about the ballot measure that provide the facts and the data to support the measure. Support the measure in the sense of like, what are the parameters of the measure? What is ultimately going to be funded? What is the type of and scope of eligible project, uh, projects that might be uh, developed, renovated, modernized, et cetera? All of those pieces are part of that informational aspect that's permitted under the statute. Outreach to constituents to encourage them to participate in the electoral process. That is one thing that is permitted and encouraged as well. And that I think is important to think about. The Attorney General's Office has actually articulated the uh, importance to recognize that as public officials, you want to promote civic engagement. You want to promote constituent activation and participation. And this happens to be part of the business of the board having introduced the ballot measure. Participation and sponsorship of public issues forums, those might be important and uh, relevant to, again, to continue the educating individuals about the ballot measure, what it entails, what it doesn't include, et cetera. Uh, materials that are produced, particularly written materials, have to be factual. Um, there are actually recent cases concerning whether or not the image of elected officials could be included in that informational material. Um, we would uh, encourage you not to do that. We would encourage you to consult with us first before that's happened. Um, and again, it's about teasing out these very nuanced rules and erring on the side of caution. Uh, you wanna make sure that the ballot measure carries its own uh, uh, support on its merit. The other is out outreach may not include advocacy if using district funds or resources. 
And I want to be clear about that. It's not only the expenditure of district money. It's the use of your meeting rooms. It's the use of the campus to have a rally supporting a particular issue. It is the uh, preparation of materials that might be used using staff equipment, uh, district equipment, et cetera. It extends absolutely beyond the use of actual capital. And finally, I would mention that to the extent that you have forums where students, uh, faculty, and administration get to hear about this important initiative, that you give ample opportunity for both perspectives, that you have that documented, that you have a record of that opportunity as well. People may not necessarily take advantage of it, but to the extent that you can provide that documentation as lawyers, we're always looking at the evidence. That's absolutely something that is permitted and something that you can do. I don't want us to be fearful um, about the efforts to educate the public about the measure. I want us to be smart about how we do it. And of course, final recommendation is that you confer with your team and with your counsel. Uh, two more slides on this. Restricted activities are, are truly, you know, very common sense uh, uh, restricted activities. I mentioned the use of district funds to promote a particular position. Uh, campaign activities as it relates to financial assistance or even encouraging donations and contributions as it relates to the measure. We've talked previously about how you might structure uh, the, f the funding um, for this particular campaign, and that is, of course, uh, independent from the business of the board and the district. Uh, there are, as I mentioned, a key aspect around what you can do before you have an official vote and what you can do after you have an official vote. Um, other things to keep in mind, of course, that there are um, some issues, and this is something that might be a bit uh, more technical that we can discuss at a later point. There have been recent case law, this is not the Attorney General's opinion, this is recent cases that um, actually called out certain district engagements um, where you hired your bond counsel, you hired your financial um, uh, experts, and you front loaded the contract with compensation with the understanding that they might undertake activity after the board has elected to present the, board, the ballot measure to the public. And so the courts were very particular about the fact to ensure that there was a real delineation between when that money was spent um, based on when the board decided to present the ballot measure. And, and finally, I wanted to uh, address some specific questions that were raised in advance of the preparation of this presentation by some members of the board. The first question that came up was on the issue of could the board adopt a motion or a resolution supporting the ballot measure after you uh, present it to the voters? And the answer is yes, you can do that. And you can do that so long as you do it as part of the standard course of business for the board. That is, you have it at a duly noticed meeting as part of a regular meeting, and that you have the opportunity as officers and elected officials of the board, paramount opportunity with your first right, uh, your First Amendment rights to speak freely about how the ballot measure is going to benefit the district. You can certainly do that so long as you do it as part of a regular meeting and a resolution could um, then be adopted to support the ballot measure. If you do it outside the context of regular business, then it becomes a bit more um, uh, concerning that you may have been using resources of and staff time to engage in, in um, the, the activity that's restricted. Second, there was a question about the role of um, the, the roles of the board in that pre-election process. I mentioned that you have to think about it in two phases of the work, and there's certainly plenty of um, uh, statutory authority that protects you with the investment of resources that obviously you've done previously, that we've been a part of. Um, so investing time in, for example, in um, exploring the kind of language that might be most compatible to the voters is certainly permissible. There are some nuance to that particular work uh, with elected officials, and you may be familiar with this, and that is when there is a ballot measure introduced, you as a public official 
cannot make certain types of statements as it relates to your business, uh, your regular business as uh, trustees of the board that might have a nexus to this particular ballot measure. And there's uh, 60 days prior to the election where in, the, in your newsletters or in your public, public pronouncements, um, making suggestions about this particular ballot measure would be prohibited and I would highly encourage not uh, to be engaged in that, those types of statements, whether written or oral, in a meeting that might be recorded or might be the subject of um, the Public Records Act request. There was a question as well as it relates to the language of the resolution authorizing the introduction of the ballot measure. Um, those are very much particular issues that um, we are certainly capable of advising you on if that time comes. I don't want to necessarily predetermine the best wisdom of this body in terms of ultimately the adoption of a um, uh, resolution authorizing the introduction of a ballot measure. But I will tell you that, that those components are highly regulated. That's something that we have plenty of experience and would be happy to um, advise you when the time, uh, should the time arise. Let me also end um, with uh, another note. And this is something that I think is important. The, the, the Fair Polit uh, Political Practices Commission is very much um, aware of the efforts by local bodies like yourselves engaging in what they think is important business to be able to harness public finance, public capital to support your institution. I will say also that there's a lot of attention at the legislature and recent law has been adopted uh, on an emergency basis, it actually became effective about three weeks ago that actually governs some of the activities that um, you might be considering as you move forward. And I say those things because violations of the rules that I mentioned carry personal liability. They're so serious as it relates to the canon of rules that govern public officials that the state legislature has deemed those violations worthy of personal exposure. And so for us, it's really critical that in addition to the fees, there's personal liability and also, of course, the responsibility for attorney's fees that are separate from your general counsel fees and the, and the board. Um, and I wanna say that because it is really critical that we continue on the right path with the necessary diligence, the necessary legal research and advice um, to allow you to do the good work that I know that you will do. So with that, I'm open to answering any questions uh, and also committed to continuing to work with you all to make this process successful. Thank you so much, Alfred. We uh, have allotted 20 minutes for this presentation, so I'll entertain a couple of questions as we have it, but we are past the 20 minutes. Trustee Antek? Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me. We have time for questions, excuse me. Trustee Antek? So I can ask questions for 20 minutes? No. <laughs> you, you can ask questions for a few minutes and then we'll, a, we'll let other trustees Our board go. rules give me five minutes. Uh, <laughs> Alfred, that was great, thank you. Am I, yes. yeah? Okay, thank you for recognizing me. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, appreciate the continuity. Uh, glad to have you back. Look forward to continuing uh, to work together. I know we evaluated this last, was it last summer? or two summers yes. ago, uh, and, and, and be back. And um, we had a very robust conversation at our board retreat this summer about the options. And, you know, there's a lot of misunderstanding about what the rules are, or, or even some folks think that the First Amendment doesn't apply anymore, that, oh, yeah, because of this, like, you can't say anything for or against, which is, I believe, to not be true. And I think uh, you, you spoke to it a little bit. But can you clarify on, you know, uh, very clear of like you can't be on campus or during you know teaching a political science class go in and say let me tell you why everybody should vote yes for this mm -hmm. like you know mm -hmm. as an employee or even a trustee but outside of campus there's not restrictions on uh, writing a letter to the editor or attending a rally or uh, communicating in, in, in support of a measure is there? So it's a great question, and, and I will say that, of course, you always have to balance the reality with perception, the legal requirements with the fact that anybody can raise 
you know, potential argument uh, and try to undermine the, the good work of, of this um, uh, board. Um, so as a general matter, you are entitled to provide your own personal opinion and outside of the board and outside of your functions as trustee. Um, but it, it is likely that um, the, the role that you have outside of your uh, uh, role as trustee um, might be uh, somewhat um, ambiguous, might be gray, depends on the meeting that you're having, et cetera. And so um, while you are able to do that, trustee, uh, and took, you want to be make, making sure that you balance that with the possibility that someone could challenge it. I will say that for our clients, one of the things that I recommend is to consider the following. As I mentioned, that you are entitled as a board, should you elect to introduce a ballot measure, to also adopt a resolution acknowledging how important the ballot measure is for the district. And so at that meeting, that you might be considering, you might want to focus on the fact that you and your colleagues adopted the following resolution with the following uh, proclamations about the merits of the ballot measure. And in doing so, you're staying within the parameters of providing information about what transpired at a duly constituted board meeting. So I would say that's how I would recommend you approach it. Now, as I mentioned, I'll reiterate, your First Amendment rights don't stop at you know, the Political Reform Act. You're entitled to do that, absolutely, in your personal capacity. And that goes also for staff members that might be interested in volunteering. In the same way they might engage in activity outside of the workplace, they're certainly entitled to work off hours on an initiative to support the measure. Thank you. I know in our retreat, we also talked about having a memo generated to very clearly delineate uh, the boundaries that we can, we, we would understand, but also could be communicated to the broader campus community. Yes. Um, you know, whether that's uh, drafting a letter or notice or letting people know in advance. I know, depending on when things happen, it could be fall, spring semester, uh, and, and timing. Uh, thank you so much for that clarification on the 60 day threshold. And once the measure is put forth, which no, no measure exists today, um, is there any restriction on the foundation? Uh, participating in the, you know, there's what we do, but there's going to be a, a campaign committee set up under FPPC guidelines. Can a, can a foundation participate or support in that, or is that a uh, restricted activity? Yes, the foundation can absolutely participate in it. The foundation can also participate in the fundraising that I think will be critical. Um, the foundation itself has its own, you know, requirements uh, under state and federal law as it relates to that. I suspect that they will create an independent committee to pursue the kind of um, uh, capital that they need for it. Um, and they can certainly be engaged uh, in the work to advocate for that ballot measure as well. Um, I would say that thinking about the relationship between the foundation and the board, having those uh, legal memos um, in, in the record prior to a decision by the board, I think is paramount. I also would encourage us to think about the kind of training that might be necessary for staff um, in advance of any potential campaign or, or decision of the board is just, um, it makes uh, its best practice, but it also makes good, good business sense. And um, in any case where any of the activity is challenged, the first thing that we can point to with any investigation is the proper, the proper documentation that was already prepared, that provided that guidance, that demonstrates not only the diligence, but the, the intention of this board to adhere to the various rules and recommendations of the Attorney General. We've gone as far as to ask for advanced opinion for a certain activity that might be in the gray area. We certainly don't anticipate here, but that's another tool that we could use. Great, and fi final question. I know um, we had a neighbor, a neighboring district, I won't say which one, uh, had featured uh, trustees in a mailer, and about, I, I think they sent out a couple thousand before they realized the error. Yes. And my understanding, I think it's two, you know something, like 200 pieces or more counts as a mass mailing. Mm -hmm. um, I, th I think it's probably best practice that we have all of our mailings or communications reviewed prior to distribution just to yes. confirm that it's, uh, you know, at least, you know, as we get closer to a potential time frame, that, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, Dr. Munoz, do you agree of that kind of a process to ensure that we don't 
accidentally do something in our vigor or support or we sure. won't, you know, that we uh, step on a landmine. Yes, um, so thank you for pointing that out. I actually was, uh, will not name the institution, but I was at an institution where that happened and we were actually fined. So it is a real thing. Um, I think just as a point of clarification so that everyone on the board understands, that's after the resolution has been passed. So prior to the resolution being passed, we're in the pre-election phase, we're okay. Once that resolution is passed, then we're in that kind of build up election phase. And I think at that point, anything that we would send out as a mass mailer, we would work with um, the board liaison to make sure that everything is reviewed and nothing is sent out that could potentially put us in that situation. I think that's kind of a standard practice at that point. Well, I, and I was even inferring prior to that, just so you know, we don't have any uh, Unintentional errors. Sure. So then I would actually defer the question to legal counsel if, sure. if that's something that is that within should, scope or possible. That, that is that is absolutely I think appropriate and and within the scope of our work. Um, really, our our role is to be that liaison um, between the various experts that are currently working to put together your uh, the presentations on on that potential decision. I do think it's appropriate to have that in parallel track to those presentations as well. Have it ready. Um, I would say that we're probably uh, better off putting together a handbook that's not only for the board, but also for staff that you would authorize and sanction to be distributed more broadly. Um, and then we would have a series of rules and protocols that would need to be adhered to before any draft materials are prepared. Thank you, Thank you. Trustee Untuck. Anyone else? Alfred, you've done an outstanding job. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time. It's been a pleasure. Happy holidays, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Happy holidays to you. We are going to move on to Section 8 on the agenda. Item 8.1, there are no items. Section 9 on the agenda is the consent, 9.1. Any item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately if a member of the Board of Trustees so requests. Maximum time of discussion of items removed from consent should not exceed 25 minutes per item without approval of an extension by a majority of the board. Do we have any items requesting to be removed? All right, hearing none, item 9.2, approval of the consent agenda. All items, all agenda items listed under consent agenda may be acted upon by one motion to approve. I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. We've got Trustee Untuck with the motion, Trustee Baxter with the second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstentions? Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Uh, oh, excuse me, we have to have a roll call vote. Excuse me. Madam Secretary? Virginia Baxter? Aye. Herlinda Chico? Aye. Vivian Malaulu? Aye. Uduakjo Intak? Aye. Sunny Zia? Motion carries. Item 9.3, purchase order ratification. This is also an action item. Actually, we're gonna skip over all of that. Two, looks like we're going to section 10 on the agenda, which is human resources. Item 10.1, new and or revised board policies and academic procedures. Chapter seven, human resources. Board Policy 7400 has no revisions and Administrative Procedure 7400 informational. This is an information item only for the benefit of the public. Both items are attached to the agenda available on board docs. Item 10.2, this is the fun stuff. Employment contracts, this is an action item. I'll need a motion and a second to approve several so of the contracts. So moved. I need a second. We have a motion by Trustee Chico, second by Trustee Untuck, that the Board of Trustees approve the employment contracts as submitted. We have several. Uh, the following employment contracts provide employees with a term of employment and annual salary, along with health and welfare benefits and life insurance. We've got a new hire position, Bradley Adamson, Director, Aquatics Operation, Term, December 11th, 2023 through December 31st, 2025, with a salary of $112,117 annual. Another new position, Christina Barrios, Assistant Director, EOPS, Care and CalWorks. Term, December 11th, 2023 to December 31st, 2025, with a salary of $125,520 annual. 
Janae Han, Interim Dean, Visual Performing Arts and Cultural Programs, term January 1st, 2024 to December, excuse me, January 31st. 2024, salary $15,103.42. Melissa Infacino, Interim Vice President, Economic Workforce Development and Government Affairs, term January 1st, 2024, June 30th, 2024, salary $120,985.50. Another new position, Justin Mendez, Director, Basic Needs Programs and CASA Grant, term December 11th, 2023 to December 31st, 2025, salary $133,814 annual. Another new position, Deborah Miller Calvert, Dean Student Affairs, term December 11th, 2023, December 31st, 2025, salary $181,241 annual. Suman Mundanuri, Interim Dean, Career Education, term January 1st, 2024, June 30th, 2024, salary $82,195.50. And another new position, Javier Villasenor, Dean, Counseling and Student Support Services, term December 11th, 2023 to December 31st, 2025, salary $186,678 annual. We've got a motion and a second. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Oh, sorry, Trustee Chico. Just wanna say very quickly, um, everybody on here, this is, it's so great to see um, all of these new uh, terms and these new employments. I, I'd really like to acknowledge the ones that are here, uh, Deb and Javier and Justin. Um, we've worked together and um, you've been such a great asset. Uh, Melissa as well, um, the work that you've been do doing uh, has got the attention of a lot of people out in the community and we really, really appreciate it. So thank you all so much. You've had a tremendous impact. Thank you. Anyone else? I too would like to comment uh, and congratulate everyone who is receiving a contract or an extension of a contract. We appreciate all of your hard work and support. I uh, would not want to single anyone out, but I'm going to, and I hate to do that, but the only reason I'm going to do that is because I have had the opportunity to personally work with Janae Hund with the Performing Arts Center when I was in the production a year ago. Um, in the theater department, and I know the commitment that she has with that department. And I would also like to commend Melissa and Facino because we've been working shoulder to shoulder on many uh, labor center and workforce development, community projects, and it's just been a pleasure. And she might not say that uh, working with me, but <laughs> I certainly have enjoyed working with her. So congratulations to all of you. Um, very happy that uh, we can extend or provide these contracts to you. All right, anyone else? Madam Secretary, roll call vote, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Herlinda Chico. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Cho Intuk. Aye. Sunny Zia. Motion carries, congratulations. <laughs> section 11 on the agenda, Academic Senate, Title V, Section 53203. No items. Section 12 on the agenda, academic affairs, 12.1, no item. Section 13 on the agenda, administrative and business services. Section, I'm sorry, item 13.1, 2022-23 district annual audit measure, did I skip a page? No. This is, oh, this is the same one, sorry, my bad. This is the district annual audit, Measure E 2008 and Measure LB 2016 performance audit and Measure E 2008 and Measure LB 2016 financial audit. This is an action item that the Board of Trustees received the following 2022-23 audit reports as submitted. The district financial audit covering the Long Beach Community College District, the LBCC Auxiliary Inc. and the associated student body. Number two, bond financial audit, covering the financial audit of the district's general obligation bond funds established by Measure E 2008 and Measure LB 2016 as required by Proposition 39. 
Number three, bond performance audit. Covering the district's compliance with the performance requirements for the district's general obligation bond fund established by Measure E-2008 and Measure LB-2016 as required by Proposition 39. Pursuant to Education Code 84040, oops, sorry, I don't need to read that. <laughs> Getting carried away there. Kind of going to autopilot. All right, so those are action items. I need a motion and a second. Motion to approve. Second. We've got a motion by Trustee Chico, second by Trustee Untuck. Any discussion? Roll call vote, please. Virginia Baxter. Aye. Herlinda Chico. Aye. Vivian Malaulu. Aye. Uduak Joe Enta. Aye. Sunny Zia. Motion carries. Item 13-2 is a report out of fire damage emergency pursuant to board resolution 110823B. This is an information item and it is a report. Pursuant to resolution 110823B, the attached report is presented to the Board of Trustees regarding the status of work undertaken on the fire at the T building. That happened a couple of weeks ago and for the benefit of the public, the report is attached to the agenda. Vice President, Dr. West, is there anything you'd like to add to that? No, this is just pursuant to the board resolution that was passed last month, and this is our report out, and we'll continue to do that as we move forward. Excellent, thank you. Section 14 on the agenda, student services. Item 14.1, revised board policy and administrative procedures, chapter five, student services, board policy 5015, <coughs> 5020, 5030, 5035, 5040-5055, 5130 is a first reading, and Administrative Procedures 5011, 5015, 5020, 5030, 5035, 5040, 5055, 5075, and 5130, informational item. And all of these are first reading for information only. I have to read uh, the board policy number, so bear with me, there's several. So this is, I'm, and I'm not gonna say administrative policy, I'm just gonna say AP. So AP 5011, admissions and concurrent enrollment of high school and other young students. BP 5015, residence determination. AP 5015, residence determination. BP 5020, non-resident tuition. AP 5020, non-resident tuition. BP 5030, fees. AP 5030, fees. BP 5035, withholding of student records. AP 5035, withholding of student records. BP 5040, student records directory, information and privacy. AP 5040, student records Directory Information and Privacy, BP 5055, Enrollment Priorities, AP 5055, Enrollment Priorities, AP 5075, excuse me, Course Ads and Drop, BP 5130, Financial Aid, AP 5130, Financial Aid. All of those items are attached to the public agenda if you'd like to read them. Section 15 on the agenda, these are reports. 15.1, Board of Trustees report. Who would like to volunteer to go first? Trustee Chico, thank you. Yeah. I um, don't really have a report. I uh, just want to say happy holidays. Uh, I hope everyone enjoys time with their um, loved ones. Uh, sometimes the holiday season can be a difficult one for, for some people. So check in on your friends and family and those you know who may not have friends and family. Um, that's the, the spirit of this season and, and I just wanna remind us all to do that. So uh, I hope you have a, a kind and a special uh, and loving uh, holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Untug, would you like to oh. go next? Well, I'm gonna let Trustee well, she was gonna go next to next. Trustee Untuck, and then we'll have Vice President Baxter go. Man, we have a new president. Things are different. Well, I'll tell you. I'll tell you, she's tough. She's tough. Um, just a couple updates. Uh, I hope everyone had a great Thanksgiving holiday and had opportunity to spend time with family. 
Um, I attended a number of events in the last month. Um, went to both the tree lightings for Long Beach and Signal Hill. Uh, very big turnout at the Terrence Theater for the Long Beach one. I was surprised of just the volume of people and diversity and just, you know, everyday uh, Long Beach folks and families were out there. Might be a good opportunity for us to table in the future or pass literature out. There was a lot of just uh, generally interested people that may, you know, may have an opportunity here at Long Beach City College if we connect with them. Um, I did attend, uh, I, I throughout the, every year I do a, a round of um, meetings with my different neighborhood associations in my uh, area and I'm, I met with the Ramona Park Neighborhood Association and talked about uh, just enrollment, things are going on, the new North Long Beach Center, um, you know, answer some questions. Folks always have different uh, issues of, oh, my grandson didn't get his class. Can you help him get his class? I'm like, email me. Let's see. I need a student ID number. I can see what I can do. Uh, it's just a nice way to engage. Um, and they're always, you know, the neighborhood associations are always looking for speakers uh, to come out and, and talk. So it, it was really nice uh, to get with the folks there. And folks who may not be familiar with Mona Park is north and then over next to Lakewood, Paramount, and uh, Bellflower uh, in my district. So it was really nice to connect with them. Uh, I did attend the mayor's uh, small business, uh, state of small business uh, last Friday. Um, really, uh, <coughs> you know, we're, we're in a new phase in Long Beach as far as uh, leadership and dynamics. And uh, Jeremy Harris, who's the, the new or the current president of the chamber, um, you know, had opportunity to sit down with the mayor. And, and it's just interesting. We, I went to college with Jeremy at Long Beach State and uh, also went to college with the mayor when he was at Dominguez Hills. And uh, we were all in student government. And here we are some 20 years later in different venues. But it was really... Uh, an opportunity to, to bring people together. It was very well attended. Made a couple of announcements about some additional companies who are coming to Long Beach around Space Beach, uh, aviation. Uh, there's even a, a company who they claim they can fly you from Long Beach to downtown LA in eight minutes on this small aerial flight device. So. Uh, Waiting to see, <laughs> but it's, you know, the innovation and opportunities there, and I know we've, we've been engaging uh, with that industry of training opportunities, and it's continued to grow, um, you know, as a growth area in the city, and just was really nice highlighted at that event. And we made a, a lot of great networking opportunities on workforce development to, to, uh, to follow up on. And just wish everybody happy holidays. Um, I know this is the last meeting of the year. Um, you know, it's been a... I guess this is our first full semester back in person post COVID. So we're, we're somewhat getting back to normal. You know, last year we were at about 60%, uh, you know, versus the forced all online the previous year. So it's just really nice to get back to almost uh, a normal uh, process and just wanna hope everyone takes time to relax, recover, celebrate with the family and, and enjoy the new years and holidays. So thank you. Thank you, Trustee Antuck. Vice President Baxter. Okay, thank you, President Malulu. Um, I, I have been kind of in an interesting situation this last month. On uh, November 11th, basically right after the board meeting, I left for Finland because three years ago, 2018, whenever, that's more than three years ago, five years ago, I wanted to see the Northern Lights of Finland. And th then I had COVID and then my roommate got sick, then my roommate died and I had to get another roommate. So finally on November 11th, I left. Uh, it was absolutely fantastic uh, to see the Northern Lights, which I saw the first night, which was great because then I didn't have to worry about it. We saw it m many more times, but that kind of got it over with. And so I was really glad that I came back. Then um, on uh, November 21st, uh, I had a meeting with, I'm going to call it the Dorothy Pittman Hughes uh, 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 Project Committee. And in uh, March, we're going to highlight Dorothy um, Pittman Hughes, who was the co-founder of Ms. Magazine and kind of the unheralded uh, uh, person involved in the, in the women's liberation movement. Uh, she is now deceased, but she came here five years ago, made wonderful presentations in the city, including Long Beach City College. And so um, we're going to have events at the Mich Michelle Obama Library and then also here 
on campus. So that's going to be uh, a wonderful opportunity for people to hear more about Dorothy Pittman Hughes. Uh, then on the 28th, um, I had, uh, well, well be, then on the 22nd, I had hip replacement surgery, and I'm happy to report that it's worked out really well. So I'm in my second week, and so far so good. I went to physical therapy on Monday, and um, I'm, I'm moving, so that's the good news. Uh, then on the 28th, uh, I had, along with um, uh, Trustee Entech, the bond um, uh, advisory um, ad hoc committee meeting, which was very, very productive. Then on December 2nd, um, the AAUW meeting. Uh, then on the 4th, uh, I had the opportunity to administer the oath of office to Robin Gordon Peterson. She's serving her second three-year term on the Personnel Commission and has done an outstanding job. And I was so glad that she was willing to serve another three years. Uh, then last night, I went to the Lakewood Village Neighborhood Association board meeting, and, and like um, Trustee Intex says, it's great to get out in the neighborhoods and let people know what's going on at the college, because in all honesty, we're not the, the highlight <laughs> of their existence, and so it, it just helps to re remind people what's going on in people's lives and lives at the college. Then today, I was at the Rotary um, Foundation Scholarship meeting, and um, I just want to say happy holidays to everybody. Uh, I'm going to continue to recover and looking forward. To, would you see me again? I'll be running out the door. That's my report. Thank you. Or in the door, I should say. Thank you, Trustee Baxter. And I'm sorry to hear about your roommate on your trip. Yeah, very sad. A lady who had been with me on like 10 trips. Oof. That's very yeah. sad. Well, it, it, this is a great story, though. She uh, was a... 13-year survivor of pancreatic cancer, mm. which is practically impossible. And she had the best attitude because she felt every day she was alive, it was a gift. Mm. And so she didn't die. You don't die of cancer, you die of something else. She actually died of a uh, heart uh, failure. But uh, she was such a joy to be around with because nothing bothered her. The world could end and she was smiling. You know, so. But it's unfortunate. But I got a new roommate. But thank you for asking. Thank you, Dr. Baxter. I will conclude the trustee report. Uh, on November 11th, I attended the Veterans Day celebration that the city of Long Beach hosted at Houghton Park in Trustee Untuck's trustee area. It was a great event. Uh, LBCC had a tent set up. We had lots of visitors. Uh, a lot of our uh, vice presidents and our staff were there. And the best part of it for me, in addition to the great entertainment, is that we had so many people come out to the LVCC tent to get resources. Many of them were veterans, so we're excited and hopefully we're able to connect them to our classes and our the services that we provide. On the following Monday, the LBCC Service Award Ceremony, I attended and I'd like to congratulate everyone who received an award that day and thank you for your service. Some of you are repeat recipients, so that's a testament to how great you are. On November 28th, I attended the City of Long Beach tree lighting and I'm so happy to see this event growing and growing every year. It just gets bigger and bigger and the diversity of the people that are there, the children, the families, regardless of age, everyone is having a great time and it just, it feels like such a neat place to be. So kudos to the city. Yeah, the fireworks are spectacular. On November 29th, Trustee Chico and I attended the audit subcommittee. She will report on that in a moment. And then this past Saturday, I enjoyed being at the Belmont Shore Parade with my family and so many of our LBCC students, faculty, staff. It was just wonderful. The uh, Monday, this past Monday on December 4th, I attended the welcome reception, the mayor's welcome reception for CSU Chancellor Dr. Mildred Garcia. And it was such a privilege to be there and to have Dr. Munoz speak at an event. And while he was speaking, I overheard lots of people say how great Dr. Munoz is. And he is so well respected in our community and so many people know him, recognize him, uh, really value what he brings to the table. So just thank you, Dr. Munoz, for representing us. And then earlier this morning, uh, we had our last and final cohort for our EDD 
uh, program. And I'd like to end with that. So a couple of things. Number one, I'd like to wish everybody good luck on finals and good luck as you close out the semester, finish strong. I'd like to wish all of you a very happy holidays, safe and, and get lots of rest and use it as a time of reflection. And I've chosen to show one picture out of all of these events. And Dario, if you can please display that one picture. This is me absolutely bragging, but I'm gonna tell you why. Because I want students to see something. Um, we took three classes this semester, and one class was a lot of work, but it wasn't graded. It was you did it or you didn't do it. It was like completion. So I did all those assignments, and I was really annoyed because you do all that work, and I'm grade-driven, and there's no A, B, C given, right? It's just check, check marks. I'm going, are you serious? You do all that work just to get a check mark? And then at the end of the semester, you don't even get a grade. But the other two classes that I took, the, the one class, which was 94.63, that was great, right? That's a pretty solid A. But look at the class on the bottom. That 90.24 could have easily been a B. And what I want to let our students know is if you look up at the top, that 100%, those are the assignments. If I had missed one assignment, my grade would have dropped from an A to a B. So let that be an example. Just do it especially right now when you're at the end of the semester. Uh, I want to echo something that Karen Vigilant said. She's our, our track and field cross country uh, coach. And she said something today that this program has taught her how to empathize with our students. Because we were not docked points for submitting assignments late. And trust me, all of us submitted assignments. That, well, maybe with the exception of Professor Geneva Chow, who was always the first one to complete her assignments. But uh, Karen Vigilant said, Seeing that I was able to turn in my assignment late and still get full credit has made me shift my thinking to allow my students to turn in their assignment late and still get full credit because it made us realize how much life is happening around us. We work full time and we're in this program. So yes, I'm, I'm happy it's over first semester down. It was a ton of work, but look at how close that A could have been a B if I had just not done one assignment. So to our students, look at that. There you go. There you go. So thank you, everybody. Happy holidays. And to all of our community, that's right. Wow. To, to all of our community, we wish you the very best this holiday season. Time. All right. Thank you. <laughs> OK, we're going to move on to uh, item 15.2, board committee report. Trustee Chico. Um, so uh, President Malaulu and I attended uh, the uh, audit um, committee meeting. And the presentation was done uh, today. And um, we encourage people to look at the report mm -hmm. um, that, that we have posted. Uh, and if there's any questions, please let us know. But uh, just want to congratulate our, our team uh, here, uh, Dr. West and, and your team, uh, and then our consultants for doing a stellar job. I think um, President, uh, President Superintendent Munoz mentioned that not everybody has been able to achieve what we have, particularly because coming out of COVID and there were so many different funds and things could be used for, you know, one thing couldn't be used for another. All of that was, um, was detailed. And our consultants even said that, uh, our partners said, uh, that the exceptional and detailed work of our team here at LBCC is what really mm -hmm. uh, helped get us such a great audit report. So thank you so much. And thank you, Trustee Chico. And Trustee Untuck also has a report on the Good Governance Ad Hoc Committee. Yeah, this is from uh, Trustee Baxter, myself. Uh, there's a written attachment uh, to the agenda. This is a follow-up from uh, January's meeting of this year. Oh, the speed of government. Uh, here we are 12 months later. Uh, but these are uh, a series of very common sense uh, reforms that we can do to increase training, increase transparency, um, make sure that we're aligned with other public agencies uh, in the city and county uh, that we frankly just haven't done for whatever reason. It's no one's to blame. But um, there are also some, some legal changes that are happening. And I, if I could just briefly step through, the first three are, you know, if there's no objection, you know, 
and, and the board supports, you know, Dr. Munoz, if, you, if we can bring these back in piece, pieces to future board meetings. The first kind of grouping is about microphones and queuing up. Uh, other agencies have it where there's a little button and you want to go and it'll show in the front to the chair or the president that says, oh, this person's number one, that person's number two, that person's number three, and there's no fighting or people, oh, hey, I wanted to be second. You know, it's just a nice little quiet little touch the button and it shows up uh, in the front. Um, that would be a great uh, enhancement uh, to, to help the efficiency of the board. Also, there's, uh, we have it for the public, but not for us. To, to mute mics or make mics active when um, when you're recognized to speak. Uh, it's another, you know, could be a functional uh, action of the president or possible that, you know, that we can stay in our five minute uh, time allotments that we've voted on to do uh, for, for ourselves. So just some very, you know, some technical things that I'm not sure how to implement, but I recommend that, that we could strengthen our, um, the process of our meetings. Um, the next one is, is free. Uh, it's adding our board rules to the agenda every month. You know, we know about them. We voted on them probably a year and a half ago. Uh, but many times, you know, I've ha I remember there's been people in the audience that look, give me strange looks like, why are you doing this? Like, well, it's our, this is our rules, but we don't show them. We don't have them there every month. So it's, it's a good way to remind us, like, it's there. You can point to, say, agenda item. 2.2 every month, you know, just like we do minutes, uh, but something to, to put there so people can see what are the rules that we govern ourselves by. Um, there was an example attached previously about Peralta Community College. Uh, they made a cooperative agreement uh, document that really we all sign on to as trustees that we agree to work together for the best interest of the college. And it's, you know, it's a very simple document, but it's the action of ratifying and publicly declaring that that is our objective and goals, um, something we can draft either in the committee or the president can do, or vice president, um, to just come back and that we could maybe see a draft and then make any amendments and then ratify it. But then that also, they put it on their agenda every month. So everyone can see that like, we are committed in writing to cooperate to the best interest of the district. Um, next one, Form 700, we have to do anyway. Um, it's already a a public records request item that you have to turn around, I think in 48 hours or so, very quick. Um, the school district does this, the city council does it. They have the form 700 on the website. There's a spot in board doc, so it doesn't cost anything to create a new text line and hyperlink to a document that we do every year. And it just makes it good for, you know, disclosure. You know, sometimes people complain about what's in people's form 700s, but we have to do it anyway and everyone else is showing it, so why don't we just show it on our website? Um, and it, it's, it's very uh, easy to do. The other one we talked about, the new law SB uh, 1439, a number of agents, it, it's on all of our responsibilities to comply with that law, it's not on the district. But uh, in other agencies I've, I've worked, I work in and worked in, I, see, I have seen that the, the council sends a document ahead of time, and it lists on the agenda these are all the items that could be, that are gonna be voted on that may be a potential conflict. Because you, know, you do your semi-annual FPPC reports, but between you know, six months ago to now, there's no telling there might be a conflict that only you know about and you need to recuse yourself from voting. And so it's an it's a easy fix for it. We don't have to hire new staff, we don't have to put new technology in, but um, something we can, and I, I, you know, Board Council Ewing was at the, committee meetings and said something within his scope that he could do uh, fairly easy uh, on a monthly basis. And then last is uh, our good friend, Assemblymember Mike Fong, passed a, a, a law, a new statute requiring uh, boards of education and community colleges to do the California Attorney General local uh, officials ethics training. It's free, it's two hours, it's online, you get a little certificate, I've done it. Uh, here, I've done it when I worked at the state. It's, um, you know, a lot of times these things that people make these speculative, general, you know, comments that are not based on reality. If you took the training, it goes very clearly what is and what is not, conflicts of interest and not. It leads to us being on a level playing field of understanding uh, the rules. And we thought this is also something that could be done broader amongst the leadership. You know, I've talked to folks on campus, but I don't know what the conflict, I don't know. 
And so, you know, vice presidents and deans and so forth. So that was the last one. It's on there, um, but it's a, it's a policy change. So if we have the ethics policy come back with a, an added amendment to require that in compliance with the, law, the new uh, Fong bill. And uh, the, Jenny talked way more than I did in all the committee <laughs> meetings. But he does a better job of reporting. That's, that's a nice summary report out, so thank you. Thank you very much, Trustee Antec. Section 16 on the agenda, public comments on non-agenda items. Madam Secretary, are there any requests? No requests. Section 17, we do have a second closed session. 17.1, further discussion of the items listed under closed session items above, if not completed, which they weren't during the first closed session. So we will reconvene. It is currently 8.09 p.m. We will adjourn to a second closed session, and we will be back hopefully shortly to adjourn the meeting. Thank you.
Thank you. everyone it is nine I'm sorry Dario thank you good evening everyone it is 9 10 p.m. we are reconvening from our second closed session there are no reportable action items however we have given our board council direction to proceed on a couple of items at this time we will adjourn the next meeting of the Board of Trustees will be held on January 24th 2024 at the Pacific Coast Campus, closed session at 4.30, open session at 5.30. Everyone have a good evening. It is 9.11 p.m.